Hello and welcome to my retro watches. Well, this channel hasn't been retro recently, but today I'm going to change that because we are going to take this watch here. I don't know if the camera will focus, which is a Citizen uh, 7 Star. So this is from the 70s, a little bit retro, but very, very cool. It's been knocking around my bench for, I don't know, 18 months at least. So it's time to see what's wrong with it. So we'll either service it, repair it or restore it, whichever one you want to choose. Hopefully we'll get it going again properly. So I'm going to cut to the bench in a moment and we'll get cracking. First of all, unfortunately, I do have a little bit of sad news. One of my subscribers, he goes by the name of Michael Kendrick Kane, Michael Kane, of course, um, but his real name is Kevin Pulliam. Sadly, Kevin has passed away. He's only 57 and uh, he was getting a kick out of my videos. Definitely he left a lot of comments over the seven or eight months that he joined uh, and became uh, one of my subscribers. And I've been really touched. It's very sad that this has happened. Unfortunately, it's not the first time, um, but I've been a little bit touched by it. And I wanted to dedicate this video to Kevin's uh, honor. And he had a carer called Agnes and she wrote to me and she's written a little paragraph and I'm going to put a photo of Kevin up now and I'll read that paragraph to you. Once I've done that, I wish him all the best. Rest in peace, of course. And then we can crack on with the video. Thank you. Kevin was a quiet but a friendly man, helping those he could and treated everybody like a neighbour. He didn't talk much unless it was something he liked, such as conspiracies or maybe the paranormal. And then he went like a kid in a toy store. I'm like that with watches. Uh, he loved photography. He loved being in nature, but it was all taken away from him when his health declined. Cancer, CHF, elephantitis in both legs, lymphedemia and a few other things. That's so tragic, isn't it? And nothing seemed to magic matter until he started watching videos of watches and their restorations. And finally, something that brought him peace in his mind because he wasn't thinking about his health issues. He had just received a set of watch tools and he couldn't wait to dive in. Sadly, though, his clock was on the inside and wouldn't have it. And fate called him home. Agnes then writes something very touching personally to me. Uh, if it wasn't for your channel, Mr. Bolton, Kevin would have died a lonely man. Bless you, sir. Well, bless you, Agnes, for looking after Kevin. And um, wherever he is, let's hope it's saying the correct time. And uh, perhaps he's looking down on this and uh, with a smile on his face. Very, very sad. Um, not much more I can say other than to dedicate, of course, this video in his honour. OK, here is the Citizen seven star and it's a pretty cool looking watch i have to say it's all black uh nice chapter ring the crystal uh is is well hard next or glass and it's battered and scratched to high heck so it doesn't really give a good display of what that dial's condition is like it's in a very 70s looking case it's difficult to get all this on camera of course for me and then here's the case back as well Bit of information on there there is a way to date citizen um which i'll have to refresh myself because i honestly can't remember but i know you're just using the code a bit like a, a seiko and we can get an accurate or a fairly accurate year on this you can see from the image here now is that that watch is running so you're thinking why do i need to do anything to it well it's running really, really, really fast. Just try and count your five seconds. Look, one, two, three, four, five. It's, it is out. It is out. Uh, there's no question of that. I've actually used a stopwatch to do that as well, to be sure. Um, so clearly problem with a hairspring and my track record of hairsprings is not fantastic. So, uh, I'm going to decase the movement and let's have a look at what we're dealing with. Here we go with the case back off. And before I've even started doing anything, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Look at that balance. Look at how, well, it's not really moving, is it? It's just rocking from side to side very, very quickly. So 100% it's going to be a hairspring. Um, equally, I've not been in a citizen, you know, actually, I don't think I've ever serviced a citizen watch to my shame, given the fact I do like my Japanese watches. 
Uh, this roach is really cool. It's black. Um, however, I'm not sure how it comes off. I'd have to try and work that out. It's got this strange uh, attachment on the end. It's not a screw. So it's almost like I need a, some sort of spanner to get that off. So I'm hoping at the moment I'll be able to just take the bridge off complete and try and work that out afterwards. But the first thing I'm going to do is remove that balance, put it on the microscope and have a quick look before we press on. So on the digital microscope, it's pretty clear, isn't it? Let's face it. If you look at these curves, curves, <laughs> coil, uh, they're all touching. Now I am hoping, to be honest with you, that that might be um, oil or some sort of debris. Now I'm going to try to, it's always difficult for me to do this on camera. Just need to move the light a little bit. So if I try and pick up the balance wheel and you can see when I pull it up, all the coils come out. And when I put it back in place, they stay out. So at that point in time, sometimes can be a bit misleading, but they generally look okay, don't they? And if I do this, I'm going to hazard a guess. Just need to hold it with a bit of pegwood. So if I do that, yeah, let's see though, that one touching again there. So it could be debris, um, like oil or some sort of something sticky, or it could be as simple as magnetism. Uh, we'll find that out one way or another because I will give this a clean in Renata, which is a hairspring degreaser. I think, sadly, it's only available in the UK. Uh, but I'll douse it in that. And if that doesn't work, of course, I'll put it on the DMAG. So for now, we'll just get the movement out and start stripping. So before I um, decase the movement, I really want to get rid of this rotor so I can attack the dial, get the hands off. And I think it's all connected somehow, so I've got to figure it out. Uh, I'm going to take this bridge off here, and then we've got some screws to take the main bridge off. And hopefully um, that might work, or certainly this side one to start with. Um, if you're new to the channel, uh, I do everything on the fly, and this one is no exception. I've got no service manual. I've got no experience with this movement. So I just go in completely blind, try and memorize where the parts are, take photos. Of course, at this occasion, I'm taking a video and see if I can then put it back together again. So now we have the, uh, these are the, I forget what you call them, like the reversing wheels. So no matter which way the rotor goes, they will always put wind into the um, mainspring. And I'm hoping that they will just come out. And then we're, we're still looking at this. But yes, I'm a bit stuck because that is not going to come off unless the rotor comes off. And the rotor is not going to come off unless I find a way to turn that square bit at the top. Well, I managed to get the rotor off, uh, but I forgot to press record on the camera, which is typical my retro watches style. Uh, I managed to get a thick pair of my tweezers, use it halfway up the shaft, put it either side of that square peg, if you like, and turn it like a screw. Now it was a bit forceful, but it did come off. And of course I've tried to protect the rotor there with some Captain Taper well as well. So I'll probably show you that on assembly so you actually see a better view of actually how I did it because anyone doing this movement in the future is gonna come across that and also wonder what they're gonna to have to do. Unfortunately, the recording mishap happened yet again and I didn't capture removing the hands and the dial. So here's a quick shot of the dial so at least you can see it before we crack on with what's underneath that dial. Welcome to the dial side. Who knows what's gonna await me underneath that day wheel, but we're about to find out. 
take the washer off and see how okay I can already see it is a bit like a Seiko so we've got a little lever here just going to try and pull that back a little bit I'm going to go in with my Rodico and there we are <laughs> look at that now then that looks um, interesting should I say I don't think I've seen a calendar works quite like this there's a lot of plates going on I've got a spring here which I've got to watch out for uh, but I can't see any of the springs straight away that's a little cover plate not too sure what that is at all yet and this is for the uh, the day wheel of course um so yes gotta remember where they all are as well those parts so maybe take a few photos now while the going's good and then we'll crack on now then i have just removed that plate and i've got an indication of something and i'm not sure how i'm going to be able to show you this but here where I've, where that plate is Underneath is an absolute ton of oil. I'll try and zoom in in edit. Maybe you'll be able to see it glisten. I don't know. But that is a good telltale sign that perhaps this is one of those watches that someone has poured a load of oil in because it stopped working. Seen that many, many times. So at the moment, I'm just trying to figure out how to get the uh, date Sorry, the day wheel off, date wheel off. And it's a combination of all these quite little intricate and interesting plates, which are also quite frightening at the same time because you have no idea what lies beneath. Now, my word, it looks like we've got double spring going on there. That's absolutely horrifying. Uh, might be easy to remove. I bet it's going to be a real bugger to fit back on. Okay, guys, just quickly put it on the microscope because I've never seen this sort of setup before. And we've got a double spring. And so we've got that little spring there onto that lever to hold the date wheel in place. But then that other one is tucked in. And uh, how, for a start, how do you remove one without the other one going flying? And then how on earth am I going to fit both of them back in there? It seems really difficult. So um, I'm just showing you this to be <laughs> quite frank. You know, I'm an amateur. I'm going to take these off or remove these off camera because I'm going to need as much concentration as I can. Okay, springs are out uh it wasn't um without an event the <laughs> one of the springs decided to fly out and if it wasn't for the fact that i've got pretty hairy arms i'd have never found it because there it was in my hair uh, on my arm so <laughs> lucky lucky catch so i do have another spring here to deal with as well but i'm half confident that i can do this this one possibly on camera and then as soon as I've said that, and there we go, okay. Right, that's three springs, and I've got a feeling there's another one under here as well. But we're getting there slowly. And just as expected, yet another spring and in fact on this one i'm tempted to just play it safe put a bit of rodico in that area and then there we are the rodico's caught it
So to me, this is one of the most complicated day date setups I have ever seen. Um, and we're not even stripped off yet, are we? So uh, <laughs> thanks very much, citizen. I'm going to remove this little plate here now. Hopefully there's no uh, spring under this. I don't think there is, but what I have noticed certainly around the centre wheel there, or the hour wheel, is lots and lots of oil. And now I can finally take off the hour wheel and potentially the minute wheel, which does feel particularly stuck. Now as well, while I'm thinking about it, should definitely move the date ring. And then here we have quite an interesting setup. Look at this for the setting lever spring. Starts here, it's got two screws in it. Goes all the way down to there. And there's your yoke. That's a wild setup, that is. And then all this clearly must be, well, some of it must be the day, uh, sorry, the, the, the hand winding. I'm not sure. I'm completely lost on this movement. <laughs> So left-handed thread on that particular screw. Possibly why it's shaded in a different colour. Well, I was assuming that was going to lift off, but of course it's not. And my apologies, I keep going off camera. So I've probably got to unscrew that as well. So before I tackle that horrendous looking keyless works, just going to try and remove a few of these other wheels. And then look at this part here. It's like a little cam. I thought that was all part of one wheel. <laughs> and it's not. That is really quite a complicated little thing, this. Looks like all of this is one thing. And then we're looking to see as well if there's any more springs under that because I think I can see the corner of one. And right on cue, there it is. Yet another. So that is going to be spring number five. Right. Plan B. And plan B is a disaster as well. I was really hoping that part was going to move, but it's particularly stubborn. Yeah, right, okay, so that part's now gone past. I'm fumbling in the dark and uh, not getting very far at all. Hooray, so there's that part gone. And the spring is still very much trying to catch me out. And to be honest, at the moment, I think I'm going to leave it in. Some of these I've seen before, they're wrapped around these posts. And they're particularly difficult or sometimes they're not meant to be removed. So I'm going to try and tempt fate a little bit with that one. 
at least try and move on to assess the rest. I keep going off camera. The rest of the keyless works. So I'm still to figure out what this is all about and uh, how that's going to operate. First of all, I'm going to take out the um, what looks to be the setting lever, perhaps. Oh my God, there is another spring under there. This is just insane. So what is that one doing? All right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put that cover back on and I'm going to remove this lot first so I can see better. Yeah, left-handed thread. I should have guessed being it painted black. It's the first time I've seen screws painted black that the indicate left-handed. At least now I know. So take a little idea, see how this is put together. It's certainly not a movement for the faint hearted. I now need to go back underneath that little cover, don't I? The only thing I can say right now is all of this just seems completely unnecessary. Just too many springs, too over-engineered. Once again, I can't get hold of parts. I really was hoping I could just fetch that out without a fight, but it ain't happening. I'm going to have to try and get it off somehow, but Rodico has worked. Thank crikey for that. There's spring number six. So just the yoke to go, which equally seems to be firmly stuck in place. Now why doesn't that want to move? Perhaps I've got to take the... Oh, I'm off camera. Perhaps I've got to take uh, the crown out. I've decided that the yoke, it's got such force on it. And it, this, this post here looks like it's been folded over almost. And so I'm kind of thinking that that doesn't come out to be honest with you I think it stays there it's far too stiff so essentially that's the uh, dial side I've got to remove the cannon pinion but that's no big deal um, I'm not going to do the shock jewel just yet I'm going to be apprehensive about spring number six um, but let's flip it over uh, that's been the most epic calendar work dial side I think I've ever done honestly <laughs> absolutely bonkers and how i'm going to put that back together i don't know certainly how i'm going to do it on camera yes <laughs> stay tuned for that one so will this side of the movement be just as worrying we are going to find out
Oh. So there's a rookie mistake. Forgot to actually take the power out. But uh, at least that's uh, <laughs> done it for me in a more safe manner, perhaps. So I noticed this part has come away with the bridge. And I can only assume that sat somewhere in there. It looks like it's got a, a hacking lever as well, so it must be something to do with that. So that one's going to need a little bit more investigation. But uh, let's just try to get some of the main parts out. We have the barrel, we have all the, the click assembly here that, to be honest, I've practically given up on springs. There's another one on there, so there's seven, there's another one there, so eight springs in this movement, eight. And it's not even a chronograph. So I'm gonna temp fate and we'll leave that one in. So once again, just need to take a note of where these wheels might go. So we just run down the train. I'm really interested to know what that is. Looks like it like almost serves no purpose. But clearly it does. And then that's the, the hacking mechanism, which again, I'm going to have to cheat, honestly, because I'm sort of like started to get desperate. I'm going to leave that one in position as well with that spring. As long as I clean it and dry it well, uh, I think we'll probably get away with it. It just saves me having a risk of losing a spring. Uh, at this stage. So another another bit of a mistake there. I thought that was the pivot sticking through the top. And it's actually the second's pinion, which is there. So finally the centre wheel is out. And then we should be able to get this last wheel, which is part of the ratcheting really for the the barrel. And yes, that's another wheel that is particularly stubborn. Look, the Roddy coach just pulled the movement out of a holder. But surely, surely it must come off. So it's gonna need it's gonna need oil in that. What on earth? I really don't want to leave that wheel in, in place as well, but it just doesn't want to come out. Get my thickest tweezers. Right, guys, I don't know whether you're bored stiff or laughing or finding this as challenging as I am. 
I'm going to admit defeat, I think, right this moment, um, before I scream. I think I'll just put it through the cleaner. Uh, perhaps there's some dried oil under there, or something like that. And if I put it through some cleaner, first of all, uh, maybe some in the ultrasonic, might just loosen that up and I can remove it. So I'm not going to do a cleaning montage in this video either, because I anticipate that the rebuild's going to be really, really long. It's certainly going to be very challenging too. Um, so... I'll clean the parts, and the next time you see me, I should be ready to do the rebuild. Okay, let's get on with the build of this watch. Now I'm doing things slightly differently. I'm adding the audio after the event, uh, rather than uh, recording my voice all the way through. Now all the big channels like Wristwatch Revival, Marshall, and um, Mark, at uh, the watch repair channel that's how they do their videos and they seem to be very successful at it so i thought i'd have a go so i'll talk you through a little bit about what's going on as we go along as you can see there i'm fitting the center wheel and i've just added a little bit of oil as well now the wheel that i'm oiling here is part of the ratchet mechanism so the transfer of the power from the rotor to the bottom of the barrel and if you remember i struggled like crazy to get that wheel off and the reality is it doesn't come off. It's actually riveted to the case. So all that trouble was for nothing. But at least I found out that through cleaning. So as you can see, we've got this little bridge here that goes over the centre wheel. And that's quite a straightforward thing to put back in. I'm going to apply a little bit of Mobius 9010 to the jewel there before putting the second's pinion back into place. And there we go, it's like threading the eye of a needle. Now we're looking at the bottom of the barrel, a bit of Mobius D5. And that's in preparation for the ratchet wheel, which fits on the bottom. Now, I missed this in disassembly. It was only when I went to clean the mainspring that I actually found that was still attached. Uh, so obviously, uh, now it needs to be fit back on its square peg. And also a bit of oil helps to keep it in position because I've got to now flip that upside down to fit it in the arbor port that you can see me oiling there. That is just because I saw some rubbing, so I wanted to put that oil there just in case. Now I'll fit the barrel and then I've got to move the click to engage with the ratchet wheel, which you see me do just now very quickly. Just got to move it out. There we go. That's all engaged now. Now then this is part of the hacking mechanism. Or the hacking lever itself really so uh, i'm not ha not having a manual i've just got to follow my instinct so again i'm just using some d5 just in the places where the part's going to sit and you'll see that now and it's actually activated by part of the keyless works later on Now it's time for the train of wheels. So the escape, of course. I'd like to call that the second wheel because I don't know the name because we've got four wheels in this train, all being told. And as always, quite difficult to get into their pivots. always seem to play a little bit of cat and mouse with these things the better you line them up now the easier it will be for the train wheel bridge to be fitted and there we go
And here's the train wheel bridge. So it's lining up the screw holes there. And then the usual fight again to get them into position. Sometimes this goes straight away first time for me. Sometimes I can be here for 10 minutes uh, getting really frustrated. There we go. So this part, which is the yoke, again, this is riveted as far as I'm concerned into the case. So I'm demonstrating it moves there, but it's rubbing against the plate. So again, just putting some grease down. But actually this is, I think I'm using Mobius uh, D5 again, just to give it a little bit of um, lubrication. Now applying some grease. This is all really in preparation for the uh, setting lever. And the first of the many springs in this watch. I'm going to get that lined up. Now, eight springs all told. Of course, I left two in, uh, but that still means six to fit. And this one being probably the easier of all of them, I would say. This is always the bit I like. You take the, the tools away and sometimes they like to fly. And now, of course, I'm going to fit that little retaining cover as quickly as possible. So the grease I'm using here is Seiko S4. No real reason I'm using it other than it's, it's a high intensity grease, so it's good for keyless works. And I'm trying to get used to it because I need that grease for the Seiko bullhead video. And it's really difficult to apply, actually. It seems to go everywhere, as you can see here. And it seems to be constantly mopping up my mess. Now, then, this is part of the calendar works mechanism. And that's going to be responsible for the quick change of the date wheel. obviously iron up where the parts go and here's the second of the springs now this is the one that wouldn't come out and it did fall out in the ultrasonic so of course i've now got to refit that one trusty pegwood hold it in place absolutely no problem and that was my first attempt on that as well i am quite well versed in these sort of springs now but there's still a few more tricky ones ahead in this movement There's the setting lever spring. I did go off shot a little bit here. And I'm going to fit a wheel here, which I'm going to call the crown wheel, because I think that's really what it is. It's a bit unconventional because it's sort of 
in a strange place and the way this thing will lever when you see the next part being fitted you might understand it's transferring basically the wind uh, into this this i don't even know what you'd call this part uh, but it's responsible for winding the watch on one side where you can just about see the ratchet wheel uh, showing through uh, on the down part of the, of the picture and the part at the top it'll it spins around basically and it interacts and i think i show this a bit later on in the video and here's the first of the black head screws which of course means they are left-handed thread so you can see there it's winding the mainspring or just about it is actually still a little bit loose the spring as i find out a little bit later on And I had to take the train bridge off at this point because I wasn't happy, it wasn't turning properly. Now I'm indicating the two screws because I got the screws in the wrong position. And what happens there is that that wheel I'm fitting was fouling on the top of that screw. And uh, so basically the train wouldn't go. I managed to get some power into the movement and the train wouldn't move at all. So I had to swap them around as I'm demonstrating there in the, in the picture and that solved the problem. But believe it me, it took probably 20 minutes to figure out that that was the actual problem. And as I don't like to leave, uh, I'm sorry, I like to leave my mistakes in the video. There is, in essence, the first one. Is it a mistake? I don't know, really. It's, we're all hobbyists, so we're not going to get everything right first time. So I'm now demonstrating that finally the train springs, spins nice and freely when it's getting some wind into the mainspring. And now we can fit the pallet fork. And the pallet cock, which is nice and easy to fit on this one because you've got two location uh, holes and it goes in real easy. Some watches, this can be quite tricky, but on this one, I found it to be, look, there we go. Straight in, no problem at all. And now on to the balance wheel. So now it's all been cleaned quite a few times actually and I demagged it like crazy because it had a combination of both. It was dirty and it was magnetized. So I'm just demonstrating now that you can see that the coils seem okay. Now, argument that it does look a, still a little bit out, um, but a heck of a lot better. So now the acid test, if you like, let's fit the balance, see if this watch is gonna run. There we go, I've overbanked it as always, but alas, it is running. That bit never gets old, I say it in every video, but at that point in time, you are really happy. I can tell straight away that it's running nice and well, it's got good amplitude. It's spinning really good, a lot better than it was. For that, I'm really, really pleased. And here we are on the digital microscope and I'm trying to oil the pallets but I just can't do it on this uh, microscope at all. I've got no depth of field. You can see here what I, I think I'm near the pallet jewel and I'm not, then I'm past it. Uh, I can only really do this, uh, if I'm honest, on my stereo microscope. And I make a right hash of it and I basically have to clean all that off. So there we go. We're now on the balance shock jewel. I've removed the top part and it's quite an interesting setup. You've got this strange thing in there. I don't know what you'd call it really. It's a jewel attached to like a disc and it's filthy. There's all kinds of like, there you go. You can see it's like metal filings and dirt and debris. Now this has also been through the ultrasonic, uh, quite a few uh, cleaning uh, applications. So I had to do it again with the jewel out and there you can see it is an absolute massive difference. And that's with that bit fitted as well. Uh, I oiled it. It's very difficult to put the top part on. So unfortunately, I didn't show that. But now we're just going to oil all the other jewels on the train on both the dial side and the movement side. And I'm just using Mobius 9010 for those.
Right, before I start that uh, horrendous calendar works properly, let's see if this watch is running better than it was. And okay, it's running really uh, slow on that. Beat error is marginal. We can tweak that quite easily. What I like, of course, is we've got double lines, which means that in theory, everything is okay. Amplitude is just taking a little while to kick in. There we go, 220. So I don't know what it should be. I don't know if the beat error is right either on this, uh, but for averaging out, I don't think that's too bad. Let's give it a bit of a tweak and see where we go from there. Okay, so I'm reasonably happy with that. Uh, bit of cat and mouse really, went one way and then had to come all the way back the other. Sometimes you have that with beat error. It can be eluding. You think you're going the right way and of course you're not and you have to wind back. So let's just try this in a couple of positions just to be sure. And turn it all the way over to dial up. And as long as we get some form of Consistency, which we are straight away. That's the main focus at the moment in time, making sure it's not wobbling or doing anything it shouldn't do. So we're now pendant up. Again, that looks okay. And a pendant down. It's a little bit more stressful in that position. And it might settle itself. But anyway, okay, let's get on with the build really. That's um, the more important thing now. So we're now onto the tricky parts and I've tried to improve my videography. I've got a second camera going here and also some new lighting. So things should be looking a little bit better, hopefully a bit more entertaining. Here we go with the Canon pinion. I use a bit of pithwood to clean my oilers in between changing from one type of oil to another. This is just 9010 again, just for those posts for some wheels. And a little cover plate to secure them in place. I always find using pegwood generally helps to guide the screws in to the hole each of their own not everybody does it like that but i tend to find it seems to work and again just check the operation now and to see if the minute wheel is turning the cannon pinion that it's not too tight That's the calendar driving wheel, so that's going to click the uh, the date wheel over at 12. 
left-handed screw and then of course a normal screw on the driving wheel as well back with a trusty piece of pegwood to guide them in Finally moved my uh, oiling pot into shot for you. But on a separate day now at this point. So I'm now going to be attempting one of the new, the new, one of the next springs. Quite a tricky one to do. And I don't know what you would call this part. It's got uh, teeth on it on the top. And you have this little cam there. And that actually turns the uh, date disc over uh, on quick set. So now I've got to fit this particularly little tricky spring. I've got the pointed end of my pegwood to start with. But there's a real risk of this flying away. It's under a lot of tension and I've also got that pointing to the back of my desk. As you know I've got a roll top desk so if that spring is going to fly I've got a good idea of where it might be. So now I'm using a flat part that I've ground into the pegwood. It gives it a lot more stability. And there we go. I was really nervous at this point, uh, especially taking the pegwood away and rapidly again trying to get that cover in position to hold them in place. And your heart is always in your mouth at this point as well because it doesn't take much to dislodge those springs I've found and you've got to have the lightest of touch. And here we go, I'm already finding out that I'm trying to put it in the wrong position. And that's really blind panic that you're seeing there. <laughs> and then I drop the screw into the worst place you could drop it into, which is right by the spring. Decided against the tweezers and you can see the shakes on my hand look. You know, you don't want to lose these springs, especially at this point. And I've put a lot of effort into this video already. And if I lose a spring, it'll delay it uh, for quite some time while I try and find one. There you can hear my sigh of relief. So we've still got two more springs to go and saving the best till last. But now again, you can see the operation of the quick change there. So we have a little cover plate here. This is just holding in the calendar wheel there. Uh, gives that, again, more stability. And I need as much stability as I can. And that part there as well is the for the changing over of the day wheel. But here we go. This is probably the bits you've all been waiting for. The double spring. And wait to see my shakes on this one because they are absolutely epic. So first of all, I've got to round that over the post. Put the short end into the main plate. Using the flat end, as you can see, it's shaking like billio. And got to tuck that in. And there it is. It's gone in first time, but you're always worried that that little spring or the jumper lever will fly out when you take the pegwood away or the tweezers or even just nudging that calendar wheel. It wouldn't take much for that to go. But here we go again, shaky. <laughs> Absolutely crazy it was. And you'll see here. I was quite surprised in my edit just how bad my fingers are. <laughs> I'm changing now to a, a bigger piece of pegwood, which actually makes my shaking much, much worse. But there we go. As soon as it's down, I'm okay. I'm comfortable. And as you can see, that spring actually caused me no problem whatsoever. Once again, nervous taking it away. But the double spring is in place and we're going to get that cover plate on as quickly as possible.
and the spring is just sorry the the screw has just decided to fly across i'm that anxious about it yes yes oh <laughs> that's the hardest part and it went on first try worth using a very big piece of peg wood this actually came from the DIY watch club and that's really useful to hold all of those parts down so pleased so now just checking that the quick change works which of course it does to my relief and now I want to put the hour wheel on but I can't because it's fouling on the the day wheel driver there so fitted that part a little bit too early but I think again we all do that many a time I seem to be taking parts off that uh, I've put on too early there you go just move it aside make sure those teeth are all meshed put it straight back into position and then there you go you can see it's uh, operating So we have this part here, which is again part of the day wheel uh, jumper, and it will also have the remaining last spring. So here goes. Now, what I didn't know at this point, it was actually supposed to wrap around that post and um, I go to fit it and it's not as successful as I'd like. It's got a bent end that just needs to fall into that little hole on the main plate. Boom, there it is, as quick as that, and that was gone. But here we are now on another day, because it did take about half an hour to find that spring with a magnet on the floor. Realize it wraps around that post, and there you go, straight away, absolutely no messing, and go straight in. So finally we can put the date wheel on, and now we move that lever that we've just fitted uh, through those uh, viewing holes. So we just pull it back a little bit. I'm just gonna use a, um, an old oiler. And then that engages with the uh, star gear, which is underneath that uh, day wheel. Now back onto the movement side, because we need to put the automatic works in. So these are the um, sort of unidirectional wheels. So they're responsible for transferring the rotation of the rotor. That it will always wind the mainspring in the one direction. I think they're called reversing wheels. I can't remember at the moment. A D5 high friction point. And I'm double oiling just to be sure. And that's the driver wheel from the rotor to those two wheels. And now, finally, with the dial on, I can get the hands all lined up. And fitted at this point you're always going to be feeling pretty chipper a lot happy that uh, the end is in sight and this one hasn't beaten me because i had actually been quite worried about the rebuild on this one especially those springs and sometimes i think you build these things into your head so i get all worked up thinking is it going to work especially if i'm filming something as well and uh, the problems become bigger than they they really are You've got to rely on the fact that you've got a bit of skill or you hope that you've got a bit of skill and and laugh when it goes wrong of course so the finishing touch of course is the second hand I find these no problem i know a lot of people get tricky but when you've done several hundred that i've probably done 
they just go on just like doing a screw to be honest with you no problem at all and now we'll just check to make sure it's going to go past the um, minute hand there as well which of course it does and now we're on to the case so we have just the minute track that fits in the case there now the case i've cleaned and i've given it a very light polish uh with the dremel fitting a new gasket this is the crystal gasket so i'm not going to oil that at all it's just to fit in a recess there now if you remember the new sorry the not the new the original crystal was uh particularly bad very scratched and i've found this stern cruise i never pronounced that correctly but that's how i'm going to say it it's an odd size it's 31.8 and the genuine one there has got a nice beveled edge and it's really thick but you cannot get that full of no money so i had to use this standard one we're just going to press in the bezel now there's no sound for some reason it didn't record the very satisfying click that it makes when that goes home but you can kind of visibly see it there. So that's it. So the watch case is now back. We just need to case the movement. So the next thing you're going to see is the finished watch. And here we go, guys. This is the finished Citizen. And I think it's rather handsome watch now. I've put that nice black rally strap on to complement it. The light polishing on the case has just given it a bit more luster. Uh, the dial is looking great through that crystal. Now, it's a shame I can't get an original crystal for this, or at least one with a nice beveled edge, uh, but that 31.8 mil is so non-standard. Uh, the dial is looking really nice. Uh, I had to reloam the hands as well because the hands had loom rot, so I scraped it all off and redid it. And in hindsight, I should really do the indices, but uh, maybe I'll save that for a rainy day. And looking at the case back, I did a bit of research actually to try and date these. And looking at the first three numbers of the serial number, 812, 8 will denote the year and the 1-2 would be the month. So, of course, that's December. Now, at the top, it says para water. And from the research online, para water uh, prefixed water resistant and that only ran to 1974 and as there's no eight in 1974 i have to only conclude that this watch is from uh, december of 1968 so a nice vintage piece here's the movement out in the daylight and you'd look at that and you'd think it's pretty new wouldn't you to be fair it's cleaned up really nicely and clearly it's been quite well looked after in its long life that it's had so far and it's a quite a tricky and challenging movement to service uh, but to be honest with you i'd probably be semi-confident of doing one of these again now um, i'm probably never going to be scared of springs ever again <laughs> because you've got it all in this particular movement haven't you let's face it it's been really really enjoyable it's always great to see these watches running again so here it is on my seven inch wrist and the watch is actually 38 mil um, case diameter, which is a lovely sweet spot. I thought it would have been a smaller watch than that. It's only now I've just measured it. I've realized that it's that lovely size. Uh, it's 10.8 millimeters thick. So, you know, nice profile fits under the cuff. Uh, so, yeah, really, really pleased how this one's turned out. And I hope you have enjoyed this video. So if you have, of course, please hit that like button. If all of you who watch the video hit the like button, that would be absolutely fantastic because you don't believe how much that can do to the video and to the channel in general. It's one metric that the algorithm uses to denote whether a video is good and to put it in front of a bigger audience. And that is really what I'd like to see. So definitely hit the like button if you've enjoyed it. If you think I've earned your subscription, then again, please click that too. And definitely click the bell icon because that way you're going to get notified of any new content. And there's going to be lots of new content coming very very soon please leave your messages down below of course i read every one i'll be very interested to hear what you've got to say about this video i actually also want some feedback on my new camera angles whether you like the voiceover in the second half whether that was a better idea 
than the usual way I do things. Any feedback like that is going to be really helpful for me going forwards because I do want to grow the channel and I do want to try and get better at my videography to make it a bit more pleasurable for you guys. So feedback definitely is a must. Uh, finally, of course, uh, retro and watches. Uh, retro, I can't even say it. Um, retro vintage watches and restorations Facebook group. Get yourselves in there. Massive community, 24-7, talking about watches, repairs, everything. Uh, so go in and join the fun. If you want to uh, support the channel anyway, I've got a tool page. There's a link down below. You click on the tools. You could buy them if you want to, and that will give me a small commission. There is also a new feature on YouTube, which is called Thanks, and you'll see that on every single video. And if you click that, you can make a small donation to the channel, and I will receive, I think it's 70% of a donation. So um, I'm not asking you to do that. I've always wanted to keep my channel as free as possible. Um, but any support given by uh, some of my subscriptions is greatly, greatly received, uh, certainly to bring projects like this to you, because it does cost me money. This video has been particularly challenging. I kid you not, it's probably been 10 hours in edit. There's 110 different video clips or voiceovers or additions and that is no mean feat by any stretch. It's taken a long time to produce this one. So I really do hope that you are going to like it. So that's it. Plenty more to say, but I won't. The video is going to be too long. So thank you very much for watching this video. And thank you very much for leaving all of your comments, which I know you're going to do. I'll see you very soon in the next one. Bye for now.